Hello everyone and welcome to week four in our cover to cover lecture series. Today we are going to talk about 2 Samuel all the way through to 2 Chronicles. So a lot of ground to cover. Let's get started. So just a quick review of what the historical books are and kind of what we're looking at this week. So the historical books take us from the time where they are entering the promised land to the birth of the monarchy, that's what we looked at last week in Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and 1 Samuel. And this week we're focusing on the monarchy itself and really um, we're going from the, its height, the best golden years of the monarchy, all the way to its downfall. And so we're looking at 2 Samuel through 2 Chronicles. So uh, remember that before the time of the kings, uh, they had to engage in this conquest to control the promised land. God had promised, hence its name, the promised land to the people all the way back in the time of Abraham. It's part of the Abrahamic covenant. But that didn't mean that it was just empty and there for, for them to inhabit. There were people living in the land, very wicked and evil people. And so part of their duty as they move into this land is to cleanse it, to purify it, to rid it of these wicked people and to establish themselves as um, God's people living in God's land. In the time of the judges, after Joshua conquers the land with the people, uh, remember that there's lots of um, independence still. It's like a bunch of different states, if you will. They're independent territories. They share a few things. Um, in some ways, they share defense, although we talked about this last week. Because of the geography and the nature of the, you know, their wars that they were fighting with the surrounding ancient Near Eastern peoples, they don't always execute this well. Sometimes they come to one another's defense and sometimes they don't. They are supposed to share worship. It's still supposed to be a centralized thing where they would meet together. At this time, it's at Shiloh and worship God. But there's no centralized government. There's no you know ruler over all of the people. Each tribe has their own governance. There aren't any joint building projects yet. There's no standing like national army. There's no system of taxation because these are really and truly tribal territories. God is their king. That's called a theocracy. God is their king. And each tribe is really mostly after its own benefits. Like they're seeking their own peace and prosperity. And again, sometimes we'll help one another, sometimes they won't, depending on the situation. The priests were still in charge of worship, the, the Levites and the priests within the Levite tribe. And prophets and judges will be called by God as needed. And we'll see that unfold in the stories this week. So as we remember, by the end of the time of Judges, everything fell apart. Uh, the Bible literally says people are doing what is right in their own eyes, quote, because there was no king. So in a way, it seems like part of the blame they're placing on the fact that things are so bad is that they don't have centralized leadership, human leadership, that is. So now we're going to look at the time of the prophet, priest, and king leadership. So we started to look at this last week with the anointing of Saul and David, and now we're really going to look at it as we look at all the other kings of Israel. So what are the attributes of a good human king? Well, all the way back in Deuteronomy, God told us these attributes. So you can revisit that passage if you wish, but here's some of the things God says. Um, chosen by God, a native Israelite, doesn't spend his ambition multiplying horses, wives, or money. This is important, and we'll talk about why when we get to the story of Solomon. But all of those are kind of symbolic of influence in the ancient Near East. So horses are equated with chariots. So the idea there being like military innovation. Um, wives are are equal to like forming a military alliance. So a lot of the marriages are, aren't about love. It's about, well, I'm going to marry the daughter of the Pharaoh of Egypt and form, you know, that kind of alliance, even though they're not supposed to. So this is why they're not supposed to multiply that. And then money is just money. But you can see why God would not want 
this. God wants reliance completely on him. Um, and so not supposed to marry outside of the tribe of Israel, not supposed to amass money just for money's sake, and not supposed to you know, rely solely on military innovation. Uh, because as we see many of the battles that they fight, the victory comes at the hand of God. God wants a king who will rely on him. Um, the king must be God's true and faithful steward and also fully versed in God's law, understanding it, knowing it back and forth, and able to then make sure that the people are adhering to the law as well. We have to remember that it's the people who demand a king. We saw this in 1 Samuel, and it, it was wrong of them, and we can talk about why that might be in Zoom, um, but God's going to turn it to good if they remain faithful, as God does, and we see him do throughout the Bible. So there's three human offices. There's pr the priest, which we know accepts, you know, he's kind of the intermediary between the people and God with worship and sacrifices and brings petitions to God on the behalf of the people. The king, as we said, keeps the nation on track according to the law, making sure that they are adhering to the covenant and govern governing the people when it comes to, you know, taxes and military battles and all of those types of things. And then prophet is someone that hears directly from God and speaks God's words to the people. The prophet are to remind God's people of the covenant promise and often and we'll talk about this more when we get to the books of the prophets themselves but often the prophets are called to suffer and they're not just giving words as a message but also the way in which they live their lives becomes a message and so they will endure some suffering because it shows the people that God is not you know, apathetic to what is going on. God enters into their suffering. And so in the Old Testament, God does that through the prophets. In the New Testament, God does that through Jesus Christ. So here's a visual picture of what the relationship looks like between all these forms of leadership and the people and God. So let's compare and contrast the first two kings. Uh, this is a little bit taking us back to 1 Samuel, but I told you last week we would look more at these kings this week. So Saul, he is the first king, and his name means asked of God, which is completely appropriate because the people asked God for a king. He came from a wealthy family. He, the Bible said he's a man of standing, but then when he describes himself, he says otherwise. Uh, so some scholars say, well, maybe he's being humble, but I wonder if he's really being humble or if it's like a false humility, because we're going to see that one of Saul's big weaknesses is his pride. So perhaps this is false humility. Oh, you know, I'm not really that important. But in fact, he was. He he had some standing. He was very handsome and very tall. So we can imagine physically that he looked like what a king would look like. But his spiritual condition does not reflect that perfect exterior. But God does send God's spirit upon Saul. That's part of the anointing process. Then God's spirit kind of comes upon the king. And he does experience some transformation. And so his rule, his kingship starts out with so much promise. He's chosen. He's anointed. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. He has really widespread support from most of the Israelites. And he's surrounded by courageous men who are willing to follow him into battle. So he starts out with like the best of everything, especially when we look at the stories of the rest of the kings. And so at first, things go well. Saul does do some good things during his time, especially with regard to military operations. He has a lot of victories and a lot of success. But like I said, pride is going to be Saul's downfall, and it is brewing within him during this time. So Saul loses the monarchy. He loses his right to be king because he fails to forget whose kingdom he's ruling. So go back to that list that we looked at from Deuteronomy. He forgets that this is not his kingdom. These are not his people. This is God's kingdom. These are God's people. Saul is supposed to be God's representative. 
And so we see that in a, several instances, Saul takes matters into his own hands. And then when he's called out for doing so, he tries to justify it, such a human thing, through blame and shame, which is what our tendency to do is when we're confronted with sin. And so really this shows that Saul's heart is not for God. So God is going to, to strip Saul of his right to be king, but also of his right to be the father of future kings. So God says, I'm not even going to let this continue through the rest of your family. I reject you as king, and I'm not going to allow any of your sons to become kings either. But what we notice is God says this, and then for a while, Saul continues to be king. And a lot of times we see this in the Old Testament, where God will pronounce a punishment but then it takes a while for that punishment to actually come to fruition. Sometimes it's quick and sometimes it's drawn out. Punishment is given. God says, this is what I'm going to do to you. But then uh, there's sometimes even years and years in between the pronouncement of the punishment and when it actually is enacted. And so we see that in the case of Saul. Um, Saul continues to reign. Now, God's spirit is said to depart from Saul but Saul continues to be like king. At the same time, we'll talk about this in a minute, David gets anointed, but he doesn't fully take over the role of kingship. There is, you know, a time when they're sort of both there. David's the anointed one, but doesn't have the authority yet by the people. The people have yet to recognize him as king. Saul has had that anointing removed from him, but he is still in power. What is going on with this removing of God's spirit? Is this mental illness? Is this an evil spirit? The way the Bible talks about it is like an evil spirit. God sends the evil spirit. And I think I talked about this last week where that that is, a, is, a, is not the actual sense that God himself like creates this evil spirit. More the idea that God removes that anointing from him and that allows this evil spirit to take root because he doesn't have that kind of protection that he had from God. So uh, again, something we can talk about in Zoom if you are interested in unpacking more about Saul. So then the next king is David, and his name means loved one. Again, very appropriate considering the way in which God talks about him. So he's the son of Jesse, which means he's the grandson of Ruth and Boaz, and the great-grandson of Rahab. Remember Rahab from the book of Joshua, the Canaanite woman who saved the Israelite spies and hung that red cord in her window, and because of it, she and her family were spared when Jericho was destroyed. So I just think it's awesome that they are part of his family line. Um, he's chosen by God because of his heart, and we we will get to know that heart really well when we look at the book of Psalms. David is a man of worship. We learn that in, in these books that he's, he's a singer, he's musical, and so a lot of the Psalms are attributed to David. Saul, obviously the people's choice, the first king, but God is now through David going to show the people what a king looks like when, it's, when he is chosen by God first and foremost. So David is nice looking, but he's not quite as kingly in appearance as Saul. And because of this, we're told that God does not really care about outward appearances. God looks at the heart. David's family, is, unlike Saul's, is not wealthy. David is the youngest son, and he is a shepherd. That means he has no status. Shepherds were not highly regarded. He's not going to inherit anything from his father, not that there was much to inherit in his family. And so when Samuel shows up looking for who he's supposed to anoint, David isn't even there because he's out in the fields with the sheep. But we're going to see that God's going to use this shepherd role to prepare him for being a king because a king is supposed to be the shepherd of God's people, even more so than like someone of might and strength because God's going to supply the might and the strength. The king really needs to have like this kind of serving heart. Hint, hint, hint. We're going to see this in Jesus Christ. So we also know that David has a lot of courage. Again, he's got a good heart. We learn this in the story of David and Goliath, a story that probably many of us knew before we embarked on this reading through the entire Bible. Um, we know David's emotional 
exuberant. He gets very enthusiastic and joyful. He dances before the Lord. He's musical. He has a poet's heart. He's a man after God. Uh, David is mentioned more than a thousand times in scripture. That's amazing. That's more than Abraham or Moses. And Jesus, we will see, is often called the son of David. So David's an important one to study. Here is a map of the 12 tribes, just a little different version than the one I showed you last week. And we're going to see these tribes kind of meld together into one kingdom under um, David. Um, here's our timeline. So where are we in this timeline? Well, we're right here under the United Monarchy, uh, Saul, David, and Solomon. And then we're also going to be looking at the Divided Monarchy when the kingdom splits into two and eventually ends in exile. So we are starting here and going all the way down here to exile. So covering a lot of history today. So let's look at 2 Samuel. So just like I told you last week, 1st and 2nd Samuel originally were one book. They were divided early in the Christian era, but they are both said to be authored by Samuel. Now, uh, Samuel um, dies within these two books, so clearly some of it's authored by Samuel, and some of it is finished later by um, scribes and editors. It tells the story of the birth of the monarchy. It continues to focus on characters, just like 1 Samuel does, but now 2 Samuel is really going to look almost exclusively at David and his family. Um, we're going to pick, pick up where we left off in 1 Samuel, which is the death of Saul. And the question becomes, how will David, a man after God's own heart, lead the people? And how will this differ from the way in which Saul tried to lead the people? So this is a quote from a scholar that I found so interesting. It says, from whatever side we view the life of David, it is remarkable. Abraham might have excelled him in faith. Moses in the power of concentrated fellowship with God. Remember, Moses met with God face to face so often. Elijah, who we see this week in the fiery force of his enthusiasm. But none of these was so many-sided as the richly gifted son of Jesse. We are going to see that to be so true about David. He is so fleshed out from for us. We see every aspect of him, the good, we see a lot of bad too, uh, but we really get to follow his journey, his journey of faith and leadership with God. So David's reign is not as smooth as Saul's. Again, like I said, because when he's first anointed, Saul is still technically ruling the people. So it's not until Saul dies that David then, you know, kind of names himself king. And he's first called king over just Judah. And that happens at Hebron. Uh, and you can see the chapters there. For So for about seven and a half years, he's only considered the king over that region because he's fighting other people uh, for the rest of Israel. And so it's not until seven years later that he becomes king over all of Israel and he's crowned king at Jerusalem. Once he becomes king over the entire territory, he establishes Jerusalem as their capital. He transports the tabernacle into Jerusalem. He drives back the Philistines and subdues all those ites that surround them in the ancient Near East. He establishes national boundaries. And all of this begins what's kind of known as a golden age. And it's going to continue to, through the reign of his son Solomon and then end. So it doesn't last very long. But for a time, there's like, relative peace. Things are settled. The people are putting down roots. There's an actual capital and there's governance and there's order. So this is a good time in the history of Israel. But we're going to find out that David is human, therefore not perfect. And he is going to really struggle when it comes to women. And we're going to see this culminate in his sin with Bathsheba. And it's going to become like a generational sin that's going to get passed down through his family line and really do a lot of damage to his sons and the people that come after him. This is some archaeological evidence. It's the first uncovering of evidence of the actual house of David. So until this stone was found, 
Many scholars believed that David wasn't an actual historical figure, that he was some kind of archetype, almost like an extended um, like story or narrative meant to describe a king, but that he wasn't actually a real historical person. Well, finding this then led them to say, why, well, yes, he actually was a person. He did exist in history, and the stories about him are true. And this is found in the um, Israel Museum in Jerusalem. So the Davidic covenant, this is important. So if you have your Bible with you, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. So remember, we've seen several covenants at this point. The covenant with Noah, the Abrahamic covenant, which was, you know, I will make you into a nation. I will give you a promised land. Okay, that's been fulfilled. We've seen the Mosaic Covenant, which is the handing down of the law, forming Israel into a nation. And here with the Mosaic Covenant, the people take on the responsibility of saying, yes, God, we will obey you. We will follow your law. Now we're going to have what's called the Davidic Covenant. And it is an amazing story, especially when we drill down on the word that in our English translation is just translated house, because it actually has several meanings in the Hebrew. So the word for house is bayit, and it can mean a house like that we live in, a house for a person or a family. It can mean a house for a deity, so for instance, a temple. And it can also mean like a household, like someone's dynasty. So David in this passage says to God, I want to build a house for you. And by house, by yeet, he's meaning temple. And God says in return, no, David, I'm going to build a house for you. And what God means is a dynasty. So how beautiful is that, that David wants to build a house for God and God says, no, 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 I'm going to build you into a dynasty. So why is this covenant so important? This is the first promise of the Messiah to come. So let's look at 2 Samuel, starting in um, halfway through verse 11. It says, this is God speaking to David. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. House meaning dynasty. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But... My love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Here's the important part. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So what's going on in this passage? Well, God is referring to Solomon, who will be David's son, that will be the next king. And Solomon will actually build the temple for God. But he's also referring to David's dynasty, which will culminate in Jesus Christ. Because as we will see in Matthew 1, Jesus' genealogy includes King David. So the from this passage, the prophets of Israel are going to say that a Messiah is coming, someone to save the people, and that this Messiah will be from the line of King David. David. So this is an important promise and one that we will see emphasized over and over in the books of the prophets. And especially in even next week when we talk about the time after the people return from exile. So Israel has thought that a human king is going to be the answer to their problems. They just need centralized human leadership to help them. But we're going to learn that it's not enough and that even though they do have a king, God continues to expect all of the people themselves to be obedient to their covenant. He expects each individual to trust in God. And we're going to see that God's response to disobedience, to disloyalty to the covenant, will remain unchanged. The people will endure punishment, as God has said, if they don't obey God's law. So the turning point for David happens in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, and this is the story of his sin and adultery with Bathsheba. 
and it's going to create so much chaos in his final years. The ramifications stretch on to the generations that follow David. Um, his sons will turn on him. They turn on one another. A lot of them have the similar sort of issues with women. Um, and so we see the humanness, the sinfulness of David. Now David does repent. So unlike Saul, who was sinful and prideful and didn't repent. And when he did, it was like half-hearted and weak and often blame and shame accompanied that, you know, quote, repentance. When David repents, it's genuine. He is truly sorry. He, God accepts that repentance as being a true act of David's heart. And that becomes the difference. It's not that David is so much more perfect than Saul is, but David has a heart for God and he does repent. He will humble himself when necessary. But even though that's true and God forgives David and God extends grace and mercy, that doesn't erase the ramifications of sin. There are consequences to sin and often those consequences fall on innocent people, people, you know, in the periphery, the generations that come after us even. And that's what happens in the story of David. Still though, all future kings are going to be measured by David. Uh, he is considered a great leader. Again, he's a man after God's own heart, but David is just a person. So what this tells us is that all future human kings, even the best of them, are not going to be able to save the people. They are not going to be themselves this Messiah that is talked about in the Davidic covenant. Something more is needed. What that's going to be, well, we'll find out as we continue our journey through the Bible. So the end of 2 Samuel, David's story ends with a, a bunch of stuff that's not in chronological order. So you can imagine like there's a few other accounts, pieces of papyrus with bits of story on it. And instead of trying to figure out where to put it in David's chronological story, they just sort of stick it at the end. So we've got like a bunch of lists, David's final words, and then the story of David and the census, which we'll talk about in a minute. So some difficult reading, no surprise here, in these historical books, especially in 2 Samuel. So the first passage I want to highlight, and you might have your own, which please let me know and we can talk about them in Zoom. But the one that strikes me and I get asked about a lot is from 2 Samuel chapter 6, Uzzah and the Ark. <laughs> uh, so this is one of those instances where the punishment is swift and severe. And so for us, it stands out as like, whoa what happened? The poor guy was trying to steady. If you remember, they're transporting the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. The Ark starts to slip and Uzzah reaches out his hand to steady it. And God like, bam, smokes him dead right there. And we think, whoo, that is harsh. And you know, he was just trying to keep it from falling. So why is this something worthy of death? Well, we got to go back to what we learned in Deuteronomy. There was laws regarding how they were supposed to transport the ark. Certain people were given that job. They were supposed to carry it on poles, not on a cart. Carry it on poles, rest, you know, with the poles resting on their shoulder. Again, would have been probably a little easier to control it falling from the ground. Uzzah was a leader. He should have known this. This was his responsibility to know. Also, David's responsibility. Everyone involved in the transportation should have known better and said, we need to do this the right way, how God told us to. And remember that fire analogy I talk about when I talk about God's holiness. If you put your hand in fire, you will be burned unless there are protection. That's why God gives these laws regarding how to transport the Ark of the Covenant. So when he touches it, he's putting his hand into the fire. It would have actually been better to just let it fall on the ground and then somehow use poles and boards to lift it back up on the cart, although really they should have been carrying it the correct way to begin with. The next story that is very tough to read is the story of Amnon and Tamar. 
Um, it ends, you know, she, it's her brother, she goes to help him, he develops these lustful feelings for her and sort of tricks her into coming to his bedside and then takes advantage of her and rapes her. And then once that's done, instead of marrying her as he should have, that would have been the, I guess, the right thing to do. It was the law that if you uh, violated a woman, then you needed to marry her so that she could be provided for. Instead, he sends her away. And so the Bible ends, that story ends with Tamar living as a desolate woman in the house of her brother um, because she couldn't then be given in marriage to anyone else because she had been you know, she was no longer a virgin. It's a brutal and devastating story. And David really doesn't do much about it. He kind of just lets his sons battle it out. And it, it ends up costing the lives of not just Tamar, who, you know, her life is ruined, but the lives of his sons. Because, because of this, they fight amongst each other and they kill one another and it just is it's a disaster and we really don't see David stand up there he has a bad track record with women we see this with his first wife Michael um, yes she has her own issues but he does not treat her well either we see this with Abigail remember the story of Abigail and Nabal Abigail is this wise woman who prevents David from murdering her fool of a husband and then David takes her <laughs> to be his wife. So clearly he sees women as sort of just property that are his for the taking. And he's a man of emotions and passions. And so we see that when it comes to women, hence his sin with Bathsheba, and then obviously his own daughter, Tamar. The next troublesome passage is the census. So uh, the Bible tells us that David counts his men and, and then all of a sudden, this is a huge issue, it's a sin, um, and God punishes him because of it. And again, this is something that's hard for us to understand, like, why is this wrong? We've seen them count the men before. Uh, the book of Numbers begins with the list of a census. So what is going on here? Well, it goes back to heart motivation. David does this out of pride. And now the wording of the way this is talked about is confusing. So 24, uh, chapter 24 of 2 Samuel verse 1 makes it sound like God is somehow causing this. It said, uh, Ang The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. So it sounds like God is ordering David to take the census and then getting mad at him for doing it. But we're going to actually see this corrected when we look at the story of Chronicles. It's not that God is ordering David to take the census. That wording is confusing. Actually, David takes it upon himself, and it's an act of pride. But we see, again, David's humility, David's willingness to repent. Um, so when it comes time to punishment, God kind of gives him three different options, famine, war, or plague. Uh, famine wouldn't necessarily affect David. He was a king. He was a man of means. He probably had, you know, stored up food to get him through such, a, such an event. War wouldn't necessarily affect him because he wouldn't have, you know, gone into the battlefield himself as the leader and especially as an older leader. Uh, but plague is it can affect indiscriminately. And so he chose chooses plague because part of the punishment falls on himself. He's very humble. He um, sets up the threshing floor and repents to God, and God accepts that. Uh, again, God, David has a heart for God. So we can talk more about these in Zoom, and if you have other things that you struggled with, please uh, let me know. If you can in advance, and if not, we can just confront it when we have our Zoom class. All right, so now let's turn to First and Second Kings. Um, so most likely these books were put into written form during the time of the exile by priests and scribes. I'm sure some of it is being written down as it's happening, but the actual piecing together and creating the book that we have happens uh, during exile and probably after the return from exile as well. This, these books are biographical in nature, just like First and Second Samuel. They focus on the leaders of Israel. Basically, they, the focus is on the kings. Although sometimes we will see the stories of, you know, everyday Israel Israelites. For the most part, we're looking at the leadership, and that, by the way, is going to include some of the stories of the prophets Elijah and Elisha, which are my favorite parts of these books.
the themes we will find um, this idea of honor and shame um, this is something also we'll see in the new testament as well it's a cultural difference from like what we find living in the United States or in most of the Western world, um, honor and shame isn't quite the same as it was in these times. Everything, you know, family name was everything. Your community mattered. There wasn't this sense of individualism. And so one person's actions could bring honor or shame on the whole. And so we'll see that happen with these kings. So with that in mind, we're also going to see corporate sin and its consequences. So again, we're looking at the nation as a whole. So, you know, all of Israel is trending downward and they're going to end up being exiled. But that doesn't mean that there aren't good and faithful people living in those times. But we're looking at the nation as a whole and really through the lens of who is leading the nation. We're going to see generational sin continue, the ramifications again of David's passions and the mess that he makes with the women in his life extends to his sons and then it just keeps multiplying. We're going to also see, as we have already seen in the Bible, unexpected people uh, be elevated. So one wonderful story is that of Mephibosheth, who is injured and maimed, and yet um, because he is related to David's best friend Jonathan, David gives him honor despite his condition, and it's just this beautiful foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ does for us. And also the Gibeonites, remember them from the book of Joshua. They were the ones that kind of deceived Joshua into taking them in and that because they didn't want to be wiped out by the Israelites. And so they were, you know, then kind of given the status of slaves. And um, during the time of the kings, they are murdered and attacked by a, another nation. And God says, I don't care, even though they're slaves, I want you to avenge their death. And so we see that that happens. So again, these slaves that most people would think no one would care about, God indeed does care about what happens to them. So the prophets, they become the heart and conscience for the people. So we're going to see a lot of bad kings. Most of them are bad, or at least in some way bad. But the prophets are kind of this way for God to still reach the individual people. They become God's mouthpieces. So the first that we learn about is Elijah, and he stands out especially for his showdown at Mount Carmel with the wicked Jezebel. And it's just the most wonderful story in 1 Kings 18. So if you weren't able to get to all of your reading and you missed that story, please revisit it. It's one of my favorites. Um, and then his uh, protege is Elisha, who becomes, you know, takes the reins of being God's prophet after the death of Elijah. He prays for a double portion of the blessing that Elijah had, and he receives it. And so his story unfolds in 2 Kings, and we see him work many miracles just as Elijah does. So despite the sinfulness of these kings, the prophets show us that God doesn't abandon the people. It's not like God says, well, you have this wicked king, you know, it's too bad. God very much cares about the people. And so he raises up these prophets to be, to minister and provide, you know, instruction and intercession for the people since the kings are not getting it right. Um, so through their stories is we get to meet some ordinary Israelites, um, you know, the Shunammite woman and um, just some of the people that they encounter on the way. Uh, and so we see that there are faithful, good hearted people trying their best living in Israel. Just because the kings are bad and the nation as a whole is trending bad doesn't mean that every single person is, you know, without hope. And in a way, it kind of speaks to our current time. Like, things are not good in the world right now. There's a lot of anger, a lot of animosity, and just issues abound. But there's also good people living amongst it. And so why sometimes our leaders might not seem to get it right, uh, a lot of times the stories of individual people show that there are still people out there with good hearts. They're still faithful people. So 
in, in some ways it parallels somewhat our own time. We're also going to see God work miracles through, through these prophets. So the signs and wonders that we saw, you know, in the time of Moses and Aaron and um, even in some ways in the times of, of Joshua and Judges, we're going to see continue. But whereas, you know, a lot of times it used to be through the leadership, it doesn't happen through the kings of Israel. It happens through the prophets. Um, like all leaders, the prophets are human beings too. Therefore, they're not perfect. And we see, like, especially in Elijah's story, he struggles with depression and anxiety, which is just so human. But God pro provides for him and cares for him and builds him up. So they're not perfect, but they are faithful. And that is what God is after. So in the books of the kings, the stories of the prophets are interwoven with the history of the monarchy, but that's going to change. Pretty soon here, we're going to get to the books of the prophets, beginning with Isaiah, where their stories are pulled out and become their own books. And it's the same time period of history. It's just through a different lens. But here in First and Second Kings, the stories of Elijah and Elisha are woven in. Solomon, he becomes king after David. And this is David's son with Bathsheba. So that's interesting because this is a son um, from the woman who kind of was David's downfall, if you will. Now remember, Bathsheba um, conceived a son from the adulterous act. And that son dies. So this is the second son that they conceive once Bathsheba has become David's wife. And he is going to be the next king. And Solomon asks God for wisdom and is said to be the most wise. Yet, where women are involved, we see generational sin continue. Just like his father, when it comes to women, Solomon is not really wise at all. And what does this tell us? There are many ways to be wise. There's emotional wisdom, there's mental wisdom, and there's spiritual wisdom. And so why maybe mentally he's wise, and at the beginning, spiritually he's wise, emotionally he loses it. Uh, and this is that generational sin continuing. So when he comes to power, there's conflict, much like when his father came to power. And this is because Solomon is not the oldest living son. So technically, the way things were in the ancient Near East, the oldest son inherited land, the father's business, the inheritance, and the blessing. But in this case, and as we have already seen in the Bible, Often God chooses the younger sons, and here that is the case with Solomon. So when he comes to power, one of David's sons, Adonijah, argues that he actually should be king. Now Adonijah isn't David's oldest. He's the fourth son, or at least of the children mentioned in scripture. But two of the three ahead of him are now dead. And the other son is not mentioned, so scholars assume that something happened to him along the way as well. So the assumption is that Adonijah is the oldest living son at the time. But David did not give his blessing to Adonijah. Uh, he did not choose Adonijah. And God did not choose Adonijah. So eventually, after a few years of struggle, Solomon does become heir to the throne. And what happens during Solomon's reign? Well, he continues what David started. So he strengthens the role of the central government. But under Solomon's reign, this is going to become problematic because Solomon un undertakes building projects. The temple, which, you know, was supposed to happen, God prophesies this, but Solomon's also going to build himself a palace and build some other buildings. And because of that, what does he need? Money and means. And so up go the taxes. And this is an issue because especially the people living in the northern part of the kingdom, they don't have as much money. That territory is rougher. They're more like farmers. And so they're not able to provide. And yet they're still taxed the same as the people living in the city or the merchants who make more money. So it's kind of a flat tax, I guess, at this time is the best way to explain it. And this means that the people living in the north are going to suffer because they can't afford this tax. And this is going to cause 
resentment among the northern portion of, portion of the kingdom. So Solomon um, does build the temple. He also doubles the footprint of Jerusalem. So like I said, he takes on a lot of building projects and he constructs a palace for himself. Now this is really the only time in Israel's history when they have had the ability to do any of this. They now have wealth, they have a centralized government, and they are, for the most part, at peace. And so because of that, they're able to complete these building projects. Whereas in the past, they've been fighting for survival. So it takes Solomon seven years to build God's temple, but 14 years to build his own palace. Hmm. That seems to me to me that to be problematic when it takes twice as long to build something for yourself as it does for God. So like I said, Solomon's known as the one who is very wise, but that doesn't mean that he is does not fall prey to sin and temptation, and so he becomes consumed by his own power and wealth and influence, and he breaks all those kingly rules from Deuteronomy 17. He multiplies his silver and gold. He multiplies his foreign wives. As we learn, he's married to like 600-something women, which clearly that's got to be a symbolic number because I don't even know how that's possible. And he multiplies his horses and chariots. Uh-oh, not a good sign. So just quick brief to show you the territory. So here, this kind of, it looks like California almost, is the city of David. And then the green here, I'm tracing my cursor, is what Solomon builds. So, I mean, like triples, quadruples even the territory. So you can see why he had to tax the people so greatly. And then this kind of purpley color is added under the rest of the kings of Israel. So this is what the city is going to look like, um, you know, going forward after the time of the kings. Here is a picture of Solomon's temple. This is very much looks exactly like the tabernacle. It's just now a permanent structure. So you can see it looks very similar if you look back at our past PowerPoint presentations. And here's what it looked like on the inside. So unlike the tabernacle, because it's a permanent structure, it's even more magnificent. Gold overlaying everything. I mean, look at the inside. Like your eyes hurt. There's so much gold in there. Uh, just a gorgeous, expensive, amazing undertaking. And there's, um, you know, you can zoom in and look at some of the, the comments on this diagram. I'll let you do that later. And then here's the map of the United Kingdom of Israel. So basically all those territories are now molded together as one with central rule occurring down here in Jerusalem, right where that star is. So peace does not last long. This is not surprising because again, the resentment building in the Northern Kingdoms because of taxes and then Solomon's issues with the multiplication of all these human resources. And because of this, Israel divides into two kingdoms. Um, so the, this is described for us in 1 Kings. So if you look at 1 Kings 11, try to get it open. Um, there's a whole heading, Solomon's wives. <laughs> so if you start at verse 9, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. This is because of the influence of those wives. He's multiplying and marrying all these women, and a lot of them are foreign women. And so they lead him astray. And so halfway through verse 11, God says, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. But for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, or, and for the sake of Jerusalem, whom I have chosen. So the, it's going to split into two because of Solomon's inability to keep the covenant. He, because he marries all these women and gets lured into worshiping many, many false gods, God says, that's it. I'm going to split the kingdom in two, but I'm not going to remove it all the way from David's line because of that Davidic covenant, the messianic promise. God's going to leave a remnant for David's family. 
So, um, at first, Solomon's rightful successor after he dies is his son, Rehoboam. But as it unfolds, the northern tribes do not want to recognize his rule. Um, they're still mad about the taxation that came from Solomon. And so they back Jeroboam. And boy, is that confusing. Jeroboam and Rehoboam, they're not related. I don't know why their names have to rhyme because it makes it hard to keep track but Jeroboam is becomes the northern leader Rehoboam Solomon's son becomes the leader of the southern kingdom so only the southern kingdom remains loyal to Solomon and this is to fulfill what God has said the punishment that the kingdom will be split into two so we now have two kingdoms and making it even more confusing Israel is the name of the northern kingdom Judah is the name of the southern kingdom but the whole kingdom was once called Israel so it gets confusing and sometimes they use these terms interchangeably so think northern kingdom Israel southern kingdom Judah so Jeroboam the first becomes king of the northern kingdom but uh, problems arise immediately because not only does he establish this kingdom he establishes an alternate religion not good he sets up two altars one at the southern point of his kingdom and one at the northern point of his kingdom he allows people to be play the part of a priest who aren't Levites so remember God was very specific about who could be a priest this guy disregards that completely and allows anyone who wants to become a priest he does this because he's worried that if the people go to worship in Jerusalem as they are supposed to if they go down for their festivals and centralized worship there that they might be lured to give their allegiance to Rehoboam and he might lose his power Jeroboam is worried about that um, so what's going on here well God did sanction political division that was the punishment but God didn't intend for religious division they would still God would have still expected them to worship together in Jerusalem with the priesthood system uh, but Jeroboam is more concerned with his own power and so he disobeys this and to top it off he sets up golden calves on the altars of his you know the two altars and he says directly quoting Aaron from the golden calf incident that these gods led the people out of Egypt these golden calves that he created clearly God is angered by this God is the true Savior and Redeemer not some golden calf created by a human being and so the northern kingdom is condemned right away in 1st Kings 13 34 so let's look at that passage God says this was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to its downfall and to its destruction from the face of the earth so the northern kingdom is eventually going to be completely wiped out and again as we've seen God will make pronounce the punishment but it takes a while in this case many years and many different kings come to power before the uh, punishment is actually comes to fruition so um, Jeroboam also establishes his own capital Samaria or actually it's established after the time of Jeroboam under the rule of Omri so Samaria becomes the center point of the northern kingdom uh, if you know the New Testament you might have heard of the Samaritans they are going to come from this region later not not yet but they will come and it really becomes just a matter of time before the northern kingdom is taken into exile by the Assyrian Empire in 722 BC now the Assyrians are awful evil monstrous people and so by taking these northern people captive they really mean murder most of them are killed and the rest of them are so assimilated into Assyrian culture that they lose their sense of identity so at the same time as the Assyrians are taking the Israelites out of the northern kingdom they're replacing with their own people so they send Assyrians to inhabit this place this is going to be the people that then give birth to the Samaritans but we'll talk more about that as we um, look at it next week 
So here is the map of these divided kingdoms. The purple is the northern kingdom of Israel. The blue is the southern kingdom of Judah. And here is a chronological timeline of the different kings of Judah and Israel. So what gets confusing as we read First and Second Kings is that these names are interchanged. So for you know a while they'll talk about the kings of Judah, then they switch to the kings of Israel, and then back and forth until Israel is taken away, taken captive, that northern kingdom, and then we're just left with the kings of the southern kingdom. So this sets it a bit more into chronological order for you because it's not so as you read scripture. Most of the kings, both of the northern and southern kingdom, do evil in the eyes of the Lord. You see this phrase repeated a lot. David's line does continue as God promised, but the cycle of sin that we saw in Judges reemerges. So people sin, this leads them to be oppressed by foreign nations, and sometimes leads them to cry out for deliverance, or a good king will come to power that will deliver them for a while, but then they sin again. And eventually, just like in Judges, this unravels to the point where both the northern and the southern kingdom are going to end up in exile. So there are a few bright spots. There's a few good kings. There's Hezekiah. Um, he stands up to the, the ruler Sennacherib. He removes the high places and cuts down the Asherah poles, so getting rid of uh, idolatry and false worship. We also have King Josiah. Um, his prophet Hilkiah finds the book of the law and brings it to Josiah. Josiah realizes that they have not been following the covenant, and so he leads the people in a renewal of that covenant. So those are some good spots. <laughs> not very many. Most of the kings, like I said, do evil in the eyes of the Lord. In between Hezekiah and Josiah, we have the wicked king Manasseh. And he is the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back for the southern kingdom of Judah. So if you look at 2 Kings 21, verse 10, it says, um, wait, do I have this right? Oh, hold on, I'm in 1 Kings. Sorry, that's why I didn't look right. 2 Kings 21, verse 10. Um, the Lord said through his servants, the prophets, Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him and has led Judah into sin with his idols. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I am going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. And he goes on, blah, 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 chapter, or verse 14, I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and give them into the hands of enemies. They will be looted and plundered by all their enemies. They have done evil in my eyes and have aroused my anger from the day their ancestors came out of Egypt until this day. So that's it. God is done. His patience is worn out. And so here he pronounces punishment on the southern kingdom. So by now, the northern kingdom has been wiped out. The southern kingdom lasts longer than the northern kingdom. But at this point, because of Manasseh's wickedness and just everything that's preceded him, God pronounces punishment. Like this kingdom also is going to be destroyed and taken, nice. taken into exile. So if, I don't know if you could just hear my watch tell me that that was not nice for saying that. I must have accidentally hit Siri. So anyway, my watch is judging me for talking about destruction. Um, okay, so the monarchy, the divided kingdom. So Judah, what happens to Judah, the southern kingdom? Well, in 605 BC, they're defeated by a man named Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to see him again in scripture next week. And um, this is the beginning of the end. So he installs a man named Jehoiakim as a puppet king that he kind of can rule through. And what follows are three different waves of exile. So the first two waves are smaller groups, mostly made up of like leaders and influential people that are taken off to Babylon. And then in 586 BC, the rest of the people are taken into captivity. There are a few that are left, but they are like peasant farmers that just have no influence whatsoever. And just like uh, in the Northern Kingdom, Babylon sends its own people to sort of inha inhabit the areas around Jerusalem, but Jerusalem itself remains desolate. No one, no one is there. It's just destroyed. The temple is 
razed to the ground. Um, it's left the walls of Jerusalem are torn down. It's left in rubble and ruin, uninhabitable. Not a good end for God's people, but hope remains. The promise in Isaiah nine. So uh, we're going to see how God rebuilds the kingdom or rebuilds his people anyway, in next week's reading. So just some pictures. I'm not going to spend too much time on these. You can look through them yourself, but this is that altar that was set up in Dan by Jeroboam the first. So under that like metal canopy structure is the altar itself. And that's where the golden calf was that the people worshiped. And there's some more pictures. This is Mount Carmel where the showdown happens between Elijah and Jezebel's prophets. And this is Tel Megiddo. This was the home of Jezebel and Ahab's summer palace. And it looks out over the valley of Megiddo. Megiddo is also where Armageddon will take place. So I'll let you go through these on your own. Oh, one last thing to talk about this circle here. This is a Canaanite altar back from when the Canaanites were in the land before God's people arrived. And it's where they would sacrifice human beings. So they did engage in human sacrifices. What's interesting about, um, archaeology in Israel is that they just built cities on top of cities. So they would, you know, destroy the people, the city, but they would build the next city right on top of the ruins of the destroyed city. So you have layers as you dig into these places. That's because they needed to live near sources of water. So it's not like, oh, we destroyed this city. We're going to go find a fresh piece of land to start on. No, they would stay in that area because of the water that they needed. Okay, so quickly, let's look at Chronicles. I'm going to go super quick through here because for the most part, it's just telling the stories that we've already seen in First and Second Kings. This uh, started out as one continuous book. The author is also believed to be the author of Ezra and Nehemiah, which we're going to read next week, and probably wrote this somewhere around 500 B.C., so written after the fact, this was truly history. This is written after the remnant of people actually return and rebuild Jerusalem. So the chronicler, unlike, you know, first and second Kings sort of lays out all of the history. The chronicler is going to choose how he represents that history. He's going to pick out the things that he finds of lasting significance and things intended for the people living in his time. So we'll see next week that after this exile, a remnant returns and rebuilds Jerusalem. It's just a remnant. It's never going to become a kingdom again, but God's people will once again live there. And the chronicler is one of these people. And so he's going to write for the needs of those people, which is they need to be encouraged. They need to be reminded that they are part of this story, that there's a continuation. There's an arc to what God is doing, that God has not forgotten him, them. He has not forsaken them. God is still their God. God is still sovereign and he is at work. And so the chronicler shapes the events that we've already read about to highlight this narrative. So he's trying to encourage the people to remain faithful, to recognize the importance of worshiping at the temple. The temple is going to be really important during this time because they're going to lose their st status as a nation. So their faith is going to be what binds them together as a people. And the temple holds this promise, promise of forgiveness for them. Uh, the themes we find in Chronicles, individual responsibility, this is this is a new development, if you will. We're not, you know, so much looking at the nation as a whole as we're now being encouraged that each person um, needs to have a faith relationship with God. We're going to see the consequence of individual actions. And yes, we're going to find grace. So familiar material, like I said, but with a twist. One half of the material is repeated from what we've already read in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, but like I said, highly interpreted. Um, so when we talk about this, it's not you know it's not that he's trying to be untruthful, but he's trying to tell a narrative that will speak to the people in his present time. 
Um, so he's making choices. What am I going to include against this story? I'm, I'm not going to put everything in there. But when I, you know, we get to the end of reading Chronicles, what do I want the reader to walk away with? Um, not surprisingly, the numbers in Chronicles are inflated, as we've seen elsewhere in the New, in the Old Testament. This appears to be deliberate, kind of like in Joshua, where there's some, you know, braggadocia to enhance, what, what would we say, the glory of these ancient narratives. So the structure begins with genealogies. Again, the, he's trying to remind these people that have been exiled and now returned from exile that they are still connected to what God has been doing. Um, so he connects them all the way back to Adam. He is really going to focus on the reigns of David and Solomon because these were the golden ages. This was when things were good for the most part. This is the major focus, taking us all the way into Second Chronicles. And the heart of this is the Davidic covenant again. So we look, we already learned about that. But here again, it's important because this promise is what they're going to cling to as they recognize that Messiah is coming. So when they return to Jerusalem after exile, they have to rebuild it. Things are broken. They're never again seen as this great nation. And so things aren't perfect. The return is not this one of amazing success and triumph. It's filled with a lot of hardship and heartbreak. And so the people start looking to a future, this promise that God has made, that this, you know, that David's line will endure forever. And we're going to see the prophets of this time foretell of a Messiah that is to come. Uh, and when he gets to the time of the divided kingdom, he solely focuses on the southern kingdom because the northern kingdom is gone. So he's going to look at the southern kingdom. This is your story. This is how you got into exile. Um, and so only looking at their, their reigns. So what is the chronicler not chronicle? Well, he skips over the period in which King David, King David ruled over Judah alone. Remember that, you know, he didn't right away have power over all of Israel. It took him a while. Um, he does not talk about Bathsheba. He does not really highlight the fighting and bloodshed that occurs amongst David's sons. Um, a lot of times he'll just say something like, oh, and for the rest of the story, you can read this other book because <laughs> I'm going to skip over it. So there's a lot of selective editing and again, no chronicling of the kings of the northern kingdom. But he also gives us some new information. So what he tells us is that even though David didn't build the temple, David was still pretty involved in its construction. He provided plans to build it. He helped prepare so that his son Solomon could just jump right in and start the process. And he even solicited materials. So he did a lot to pave the way for his son kind of everything that he could do without actually building the temple itself. And then we also learn, and I find this so fascinating in 2 Chronicles 33, that that wicked king Manasseh repented. Uh, why they don't talk about this in Kings, I don't know. I don't know if it just wouldn't have fit this narrative that God, you know, handed down punishment and then he repents. I'm not sure. This is something we could discuss so that would be interesting. But here in the Chronicles, we learn that he repents and receives mercy from God. And, ooh, this just hits a spot within us because we see the truth that God can restore even the worst of sinners. We're going to see that truth in the New Testament, but we even see that here in the Old Testament. So, it's a good story. If you didn't have a chance to look at it, go look at Second Chronicles 33. There's some difficult reading, the story of Uzzah in the Ark again. I'm not going to talk about that again, um, but you can look at the slide and we can talk more about it in Zoom if there's something that you still have a question about. Um, high places. So a lot of the kings are said, you know, this king removed some of the high places, but then some don't. And what is going on? Um, so there's kind of two types of high places. There are high places for pagan worship, which obviously is bad in every way. But then there's also high places where the people are worshiping God. And that in its way is bad as well. Even though they're worshiping God, which is good, they're supposed to be doing that in Jerusalem in a centralized location. So uh, God wants those to be removed as well. So for instance, King Asa will see that he removed the high places 
But then we read that he did not remo remove all the high places. So what's going on here? Well, he removed all the high places being used for pagan worship, but he didn't remove all the ones being used to worship God. And so God calls him out on that. And then we also have David counting the men, which I talked about. So you can read through this slide as well. And again, if you have questions, we will talk about it in Zoom. Um, so Jerusalem falls. This is depicted in Chronicles. Despite repeated warnings through God's prophets, which we're going to see when we look at the book of the prophets, the people continue to reject God. And they do so in three ways. They're unfaithful. They allow the temple to be defiled or participate in it themselves. And they laugh at and mock the prophets. And so this we will look at in depth when we get to the books of the prophets. So the temple is destroyed, as I said. Jerusalem is left in rubble, and the people are carried off to Babylon. But there is hope. King Cyrus issues a decree. So this is what we will turn to next week as we look at the ramifications of that decree and what happens when the people are allowed to return to Jerusalem. And finally, I had a great question in Zoom last week about women in the Old Testament. And um, there's just too much to talk about in Zoom or in this lecture because it would make it extremely long. So I'm working on like a supplemental brief, maybe seven minute thing about women in the Old Testament because there's some, some interesting things to focus on. And I want to make sure that I answer that question properly. So stay tuned for that. I will include that in one of our newsletters. So let me close with prayer for us. Gracious God, thank you so much for the gift of your revelation, the gift of your word, and the fact that we are able to study this together in community. Lord, I pray for encouragement for everyone listening. Um, Lord, that you would help us to press on, especially through the difficult parts of scripture, and that we would grow in our faith and in our desire to serve you, God. Help us to be your hands and feet and to bring light into the darkness. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I will see you all in Zoom this week, hopefully, or please send me, email me your questions, and I hope you have a wonderful week.